Well, g'day, Ronsley. How are you going? Thank you so much for joining me. I've, I've been wanting to chat with you for a little while, so thank you so much. Hey, Rowan, what a pleasure. Thank you. I, uh, we chat a lot, but one that gets captured is, is always good. So thank you for having me. It's good. Exactly. And good to sit down one-on-one -on -one as well. And, and just before we get too much into the interview as well, I do actually just want to point out that you're the first person that I'm actually interviewing twice. Uh, who's basically, you know, not, not a family member sort of thing. So, um, yeah, we, we interviewed each other. Oh, I interviewed you back in, I think it was 2016 uh, now. So, wow. gosh, five years ago now. And, um, yeah, so it's, oh, it's crazy to, uh, to be back here again and, and have come so far. So um, you've been a big part of that. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. No, I, we, we think about you a lot. I think about you a lot, especially because of the journey and, and the idea that if we – found people like you uh you know we'd have a we'd have a good time whatever we did so um you know the feeling is absolutely mutual so uh you know it's great to see your progress it's get, great to see you grow um yeah it's uh it's been crazy i can't i can't believe that it was 2016 when we first met but <laughs> wow, that's been a while yeah oh certainly and uh yeah, as I say, you know, so much is, uh, has changed in that time. But, uh, but yeah, I suppose uh, before we get, uh, well, before we get too much into it, um, yeah, one of the things that uh, that I am interested in talking to you about today is that philosophy is uh, one of the things that's really drawn me to you know where our podcast and everything since then. So, uh, yeah, keen to unpack a little bit of that. Um, before we get too much further into it, though, um, I suppose just to get a bit of a sense of your story, one uh, one question that I like to ask people uh, is about the idea of the hero's journey and your own sense of your own hero's journey, because I've got a bit of a theory that everyone's on their own a little bit. So I was just wondering, uh, just to start, what is your sense of the idea of a, a call to adventure? Is that something that you've ever experienced before? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in my case, I, I don't know about, yeah, there is a hero's journey for sure. I can look back and see, you know, some really cool stuff that I've experienced and, uh, some l really low stuff that I've experienced. So I can see the curve. I've, I can see the person that has come along and challenged me to kind of like, you know, step up my game and <clears throat> they've deferred in kinds of people and who they kind of were and how they showed up in the different times. If I, if I look back, however, I think that in general, even when it's on a high, I haven't found I suppose or I'm still learning, I'm getting better at experiencing the high because I've never really experienced the high. So what, what used to happen or what used to feel like uh, the constant low. So because of that situation, I think I convinced myself that the idea, the only way to kind of enjoy this is to think of it as an adventure. And I think as a result, it has come, um, uh, it has become this regular adventure, like there's never a day that I know what's going to happen. Never, like not a single day. It's crazy, right? Like uh, from the kinds of interactions to the kinds of conversations, like who knew I would be talking about this right now? I didn't know when I woke up. You know, so I, I think that um, from a sense of adventure perspective, I, I feel like because the world is in this illusion of destination, like when when this happens, then, uh, you know, I, I understand it. And I think it's something that is programmed into us. It is something that we need to actively unlearn or learn or, or use in a in a productive manner, maybe, I, I, I don't know, but I'm still on that journey, I feel. So I think that for me, um, it's, it's a constant adventure because it's like, if it's not a constant adventure, I don't think I could have solved or made the decisions that I'm making right now or be involved in the conversations I'm, I'm having right now. So there's a huge element of change and growth and and learning and being absolutely humbled by the whole situation because you get your ass handed to you at times uh, a lot and you just have to learn to like, you know, move on. 
Yeah, certainly. Well, um, yeah, it's fascinating. And I find uh, quite often when you speak to entrepreneurs and other people in business, and they do quite often have that sense of, you know, it's not as if it was something in the past that kind of got me to where I am now. Um, the call to adventure could be coming tomorrow. It could be, you know, this morning at 10 o'clock in a, in a, you know, smaller way in some sense. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting, but, uh, but I suppose what I picked up on from that was, uh, was the, I suppose, emphasis on the, on the high that you put in terms of like potentially a, a mood or an enjoyment factor, but I would almost challenge you on, on one thing in terms of the fact that you haven't had, for example, heroes journeys, you know, even grand scale heroes journeys in your past, because I know like to do with the dark night of the soul, for example, and, and, you know, transformation that comes out of that. I know you found yourself in a, in a period of debt at time, uh, at a time, which, uh, which, which potentially led you to, to transform, to, to change your direction to where you are now. So could you speak to us a little bit about, I suppose, that, that dark night of the soul period, which I assume was, was part of that time and potentially how that led you to, to change direction a little bit? I mean, it's funny that you say and you refer to that piece because there have been so many. It's just that that one in particular has been documented, right? It's like uh, it became, actually, it got documented because I joined a course uh, like how you joined the Whamley, right? I joined Key Personal of Influence. And they use that story to market the Key Personal of Influence brand like crazy, like in everything that they had, any workshop, they would bring me in, they would zoom me in and they would, and they would have slides about me because I think they, they kind of felt this like you, and a lot of people, when they talk about it, they kind of feel like that was probably the darkest moment. And maybe it was. I don't know how to tell the difference of darkness, but I don't necessarily, when someone asked me about like, oh, you know, hard stuff, like I think of the last one that happened when it happens quite recently, right? And it, and it kind of like, and then, and then you go, oh yeah, those are big ones. And I think because of those big ones, they allowed me to build to this point that we got here. And... <clears throat> I find that whole thing quite fascinating. So for, from a perspective of uh, my first business and the question that you were asking, my first business was a restaurant. Everyone told me, and I still, my probably my biggest gift is cooking for people. Um, everyone told me to monetize my passion. Well, I, I think that that was probably the, the simplest thing to do. So as I got my chef qualifications while I opened a restaurant and, you know, I did that. It was just a crazy learning curve, not in food. Yes, in food. Of course, I learned so much, uh, so much like my brain can multitask on new levels because of being in the kitchen and, and having that. However, um, the business model, I learned so much. I, I think it, it broke so many times. It was so difficult to, to, to make the business model work, right? So long story short, um, uh, we did service on Saturday. On, on Sunday, the locks were changed. And I had $478,000 of debt. And I didn't want to declare bankruptcy because I had some equity in my house and I had a car and, and other stuff. And I think I couldn't, I couldn't open a business for another three or five years, something like that. And I was like, oh, I don't want to work for three or five years. I will kill me. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm going to pay this money back. So I think um, through that period of paying that money back, which was done in two years and one month, um, uh, there were lots of hard moments for what, I think someone in Australia would consider them hard moments, right? But when you travel and you come from different parts, you realize that this is paradise. Like every single day to be able to wake up and know you have food in your fridge. And, and in most cases, you can control the temperature of your room. Come on. Like, yeah, you know, and you have carpet on the floor, however bad the carpet might be. You know, it's like, it's all perspective, right? It's all fascinating. So... Um, yeah, I mean, I had the, the debt collectors and the person, the people wanted to take the car and having that conversation, I've never had those kind of conversations, never had a conversation with someone serving me an eviction notice. Like he was so rude. I can remember, I, I mean, he, he didn't know me for, from anything. Like he didn't know any of the situation, but 
it was all these kind of like, you know, interactions that I was like, wow, this is such a crazy learning, right? Um, that most people don't go through. So they don't learn from and it, however hard they've been, you know, there's there's been learnings that my subconscious and my brain and unconsciously I've picked a lot of things up. So I don't know. I think uh, the, it, I, it's it's the darkness, I think, is like um, it's hard. It's important. But o only the knights maybe have the courage to probably be there and sit there so that they can go. So that's the way I see it. That's the way I think about it, Ron. And I've actually said this to a friend, which I should say to myself more often. And I remember this because Chris Dufay, you, you, you might know him. Yes, yeah, so he was um, taking a one week sabbatical from his family, right? He's got a, he's got, yeah, uh, from, from his wife and, and three daughters, who, his wife decided that that was, that was the thing to do because in COVID, usually he's traveling and he didn't travel and all that kind of stuff. And he needed, he needed a week by himself. And then he dropped by here and um and he was like man i'm I'm, I'm, ha I'm having a hard time with this whole thing and 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 i said hey you know uh do you remember the vikings as leaders you know they were quite different to you know the the, the english as leaders i mean if you're talking about oh, romans you know the romans the leaders were behind the vikings the the kings used to fight up front right and before there used to be this big war, the king, right, would go into the forest for like a month or two months or whatever they decided. And though that was for them to harden themselves up, to take whatever needs to be taken, to learn whatever needs to be learned and stay for however long they need to learn to, 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 to be there in their own darkness so that when they go and lead their people, they can be the light. So that I could see his whole face change with that story. And even now when I tell it, I'm like, ah, that gives more purpose. So um, I feel like I feel like I feel like just reminding people of that kind of stuff is quite helpful. Yeah, well, I think it's so interesting. And I'll, it's certainly something that uh, that yeah, we I don't think we do much of in terms of that kind of almost stopping and stepping back and and, and taking stock really. And um, yeah, I know it's something that Philip McKernan is someone that, uh, that the, uh, well, I've heard speak uh, and that, that you're uh, well connected with. And he speaks about that a little bit in terms of uh, not having that time to kind of step back. But I suppose what's really interesting about that to me is, uh, is that that insight comes out of, for example, a time that you mentioned there where you had, for example, a lot of debt. I imagine there would have been quite a, a sort of pragmatic bench that you would have had to pay that off in terms of basically any way you could it uh yeah in, in any way but but then to be able to have i suppose the the insight to kind of go hold on it's not necessarily just about getting this done and being at the grindstone the whole time i do need to kind of step back and and take stock from that so was that something that for example uh that, that you were aware of at the time when i imagine there would have been that real kind of uh well the need to for example go out and make money to to pay off this debt did you have that sense at that time? Hold on, I'm you know I'm really you know firing on all cylinders, but it's not necessarily giving me the opportunity to step back and and really reset in certain ways. Yeah, Rowan, that's I don't say this often, by the way, but that's a really good question uh, from the conversation as well, and how you, you've arrived at that question is quite uh, phenomenally amazing. Um, but to answer your question. I feel that I am privileged that I had the opportunity to step back because a lot of times people don't in their lives don't have the opportunity to step back. You know, they don't have or they don't see that they have the opportunity to step back as well. Um, there's, an, that's, there's another element there. It's not necessarily one or the other, but, it, you know, um, <clears throat> for me, well, I feel like, you know, having my family around to support, um, even though Rochelle was not here um, when it happened, 
uh, she was on she was on Skype at the time, like twenty four seven, literally, um, uh, you know, trying to just be there. Um, but I feel like at the time I just borrowed her courage, right? If she did not believe in me in in the way that she did, in the sense that she never put pressure on me, she didn't like kind of uh you know freak out or, or, or any of that stuff as well and when i when i um i'll give you a great example on this Rowan. like to do the key person of influence program so what happened was i did a friend a favor i built her website and as a thank you she got me these vip tickets with herself to go to key person of influence thing one day event so and i had never been to any of these events before so that was my first event right so i that's literally my first event you, you just imagine that everything you've seen <laughs> from me, you know so that was my first event and um and i came home and i said and rochelle asked me like how was it and i said it was great She's like, no, what do you mean? And she asked me to tell her. So it was like, that went on for 45 minutes conversation. And then she's like, uh, so you, you signing up? And I said, no, we, we don't, we don't have the money. It's like, I think it was, I think it was like 10 grand at the time. Maybe it was 10 now it's 17 or something, but at the time it was 10 grand maybe. Um, and, uh, she's like, no, we'll find the money. And, that, you know, I, I can remember the way she said it to me because I didn't even think that that was an option. You know what I mean? So those little bits that I remember now, I'm like, I think all that, you know, contributed because if that interaction did not happen, then I would have signed up for Key Person of Influence. If I didn't do that 40 week accelerator, I would not have built anything that that now people are talking about even though that was that's only like an eight-year-old story it's not like long right it's just eight years so um no at the time i think it's just the people around you that you, you have to appreciate after after the fact because at the time it's hard because you're just trying to like you're trying to do the next thing like i didn't i didn't rochelle didn't know the number the actual number, she had no idea until it was paid off. I did not say it out loud until it was paid off. I think it was a defense mechanism, maybe. Um, so I think that <laughs> I think that I'm extremely privileged to have been given the opportunity to experience these things. Like not many people can experience what I just went through or what I just, you know, um, put down and 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 I feel extremely privileged to be in Australia because I think that if I wasn't here in this country I don't think I would have had the kind of options and opportunities that um, I wish more of us Australians took seriously um, and 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 had more of a a non-myopic view of the privilege that you know, uh we have here yeah 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 certainly and there's something about that that i uh that i want to chat to you about a little bit more specifically in a moment but um but just to i suppose close off the thing about dent and uh key person of influence that's actually how we got connected as well so you talk about a sliding doors moment in terms of my dad was actually one of the people who did that uh did that accelerator and i think he met you there and uh and encouraged so no there's oh, a there's the sorry Rowan. so yeah, so your dad. Bali, wasn't it? Or something like that? Or... Yeah, yeah, so your dad. So one of the mentors was Andrew Griffiths. That's right, yes. yes. And he had his own um, author retreat, which he asked me to speak at at Bali. That's and I did the podcasting element. And then I met your dad. And I, I interviewed all of them who came to the retreat. And um, 
that's how he and then he sent me a message and and yeah. uh <laughs> it's 2021 that's crazy exactly yeah how it all turns out it's uh yeah well uh, to me it just speaks to the the power of i suppose taking those opportunities when they do come up but um but i suppose what uh what i'm really fascinated about that and i look correct me if i'm wrong here but um but it seems to me that there was you know this real kind of need back then to uh to, to obviously pay off the debt and you know it was very much um you know what can we do and obviously rochelle had a big part of that as well uh but to me one of the things that really stands out about the way that you do things now is just how strong your mission is in terms of wanting to enable people to get their voice out there and obviously audio uh, and podcasts are a huge part of that. And, and look, I'll just say, to, look, I'm hugely inspired by that. It's, it's probably not something that I sort of realized until later on, just the degree until uh, to which that, for example, influenced even this podcast and other things. But what strikes me about that is, is you know, back then such a strong necessity uh, to now, such a strong mission what did it look like to, I suppose, go through the transition period of almost being, all oh, right, we've got to do this. And then, you know, for example, the debt's paid off. And, uh, and, and then, yeah, was it, for example, uh, something that happened organically or, yeah. So um, I believe there are a couple of elements to that. Like my, I think my personality, I've got to give me some credit, like the, the kind of person that I am in the sense that, um, my mother drilled this thing into me that I could do whatever I wanted. Like it's, it's, it seems weird, but I think that I, my psyche and my aura took it seriously because if I start to list the things I've done in 40 years, like it seems like there's three or four lifetimes in it. Right. And, and I, and I am surprised by it. I promise you, like, I'm still like, look at it and go, how, you know, how, in what time frame? how did that happen? And, you know, time, it just becomes this meaningless thing. It's, it's really meaningless, right? So I, I believe that inside me, I've always believed that I've been given, I've been given 50 gold coins. Like there's this, this parable in the Bible about these three people that have been given, like, you know, I think one, three and five and, you know, one doubles it, one hides it away. And, you know, this, this is a whole thing about it. And I just believe that I, in terms of gifts have been given 50 and I kind of always, maybe it started off being trying to prove my dad or try to prove that I am, I, I could do it on my own, not by my dad wrong or any of that. My dad always wanted to give me stuff and I kind of always wanted to go, no, I want to be independent. I left home when I was 16. I was like, I, I, wanna, I just want to be Ronsley. I don't want to be Richard's son. I, I left Goa because of all that, you know, Goa was known as Richard's son. So, um, and my dad had a similar sort of hero's journey as well. So now when I think about it, so I think inside me, there's always been this, um this belief that i've been gifted or given not like gifted sounds wanky but i've been given this stuff like it's just been dropped into my lap i could have been born in any family i could have been dealt so many different cards i just feel like life just gives me these aces and i've got literally a whole stack of aces and i go if I complain right now, I'm literally, st I said this to Rochelle yesterday and she's like, Ronsley, you know how money, how many things you're dealing with right now. And she had to break it down, but my psyche doesn't, my brain doesn't understand it. So it's this really interesting phenomenon because my brain doesn't believe something else. And, and it's almost like uh, my emotions need to catch up or, or something to that effect. And now I'm after being married uh, now for eight years, um, Rochelle said that when we got married, that I had only two emotions, happy and angry. I was only angry because I wasn't happy. And, uh, Sounds like and, <laughs> <laughs> and now apparently there are more. So, um, so I don't know. I just feel like I'm learning so much. I've been given the gift of being able to grasp things. I can learn things extremely quickly. Um, 
So uh, I don't know, man. When it looks, when I look back, it seems all great. It seems like a great story. But at the time, it's just like literally one foot in front of the other. You wake up today and you're like, oh, what am I meant to do? Like, what's on my plate? And 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 then, I don't know, just just keep taking them off. <laughs> Oh, no, well, um, well, it is, you know, it, it, it is great. And I think it's, look, it's something that I think separates you. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have been able to sort of say it, and I'm going to embarrass you a little bit <laughs> now. But, um, but I think it's something that separates you from, from other people. Uh, to me, is that real idea of gratitude. And it really comes through even in what you're saying there in terms of, you know, some of your friends are some of the, you know, the most kind of influential people on, on the planet in terms of people like, you know, Darren Arlene and, and Gary Vaynerchuk and, and Zach Efron and people like this. And, uh, and, but, but to be in that position, you've always got this feeling of gratitude that really comes through. And, and one of the ways that that does come through, and I alluded to it before, but, but you acknowledge the traditional owners uh, or the traditional custodians of Australia on your podcast. Uh, also at all of the sessions that we do uh, in We Are Members and We Are Podcast. Um, but I'd, I'd just like to speak to you a little bit about that in terms of some of the motivation for that. Why yeah. do you do that? Um. I have I have goosebumps right now. It's it's um, it's crazy for a person born in Bahrain in the Middle East um, of Indian origin who's been considered Indian his whole life to now be Australian. Um, and so, backstory: I've spoken English my whole life. English is my first language, but to get an Australian. I think it was residency. I don't, I don't even think it was citizenship, but to get a residency, I had to give an English exam, exam three times, right? And um, in, in the course of two or three years or something like that, um, I wrote a thesis in English, a master's thesis in English. Uh, and I was indoctrinated into the Australian way um, to become an Australian citizen. So there's a whole backstory to being able to give up my Indian, because I have to give, I had to give up my Indian citizenship. Indian, India doesn't allow dual citizenship. So um, I had to give up my Indian citizenship to become Australian. And only recently I found out the real history of the country that I call home. And I call, I say that I'm Australian Wait, someone asked me, you know, <laughs> where, who are you? Where are you from? I said, I'm Australian because I am. I, I, I mean, you know, um, and it's difficult for a lot. Even even Rochelle, we have multiple questions, you know, conversations around. Am I Australian? Am I Indian? Am I what? Right. So the reason for the acknowledgement is. When I understood the real history and the real learning of my adopted people now um it gave me so much um so many tools to reconcile my ancestry it gave our culture is just one of the most phenomenal cultures on the planet right our australian culture it's just that even our australians don't know that and like me, I bet there are a whole bunch of other people. So for that reason, I decided that I would always acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the, this country I now call home, uh, who's adopted me. And I've learned so much of the ability to, to, to belong to the land, right? Um, but also, it, the acknowledgement allows me to look at my ancestors and my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents and realize that <laughs> I am so lucky and privileged to be able to do, you know, every single thing that I'm doing right now from being able to wake up in a comfy bed to be able to going to sleep in a comfy bed and, um, and having food to eat and having these kind of conversations and, and all that kind of stuff. Like I can't, yeah, I have to look back at the generations and, and see what they've built and what they they've given the next generation and that generation built on that. 
So I, I, I thought that I started doing that to bring up more people to ask the question like you just did so that more people would know that Australia is not a white nation and Australians have so many colors and look so different and um and we have 10,000 generations of history <laughs> it's crazy yeah, it's, it's so true and it's something that yeah as you say like we we just don't touch on it anywhere near and i feel maybe like in you know obviously being in the southeast of australia we don't have as much of an indigenous population as other parts of australia so like i feel it's something that we do really miss out on in in some ways and and there's a couple of points that i do want to touch on about that um one of them is uh, the idea, we'll, we'll chat about this a little bit more in a sec, um, but the idea of sort of acknowledging ancestors, acknowledging those that, that came before us, I think is something that's so important uh, because no one lives in a vacuum. There's no one that doesn't benefit from those who've, who've come before them in that sense. But, but just one thing I want to quickly uh, mention before we get into that is, is one thing that really stands out to me about the way that you do that. And one thing that I've really gotten from that, I think, is that I feel that in Australia, we don't have much deference in society. Uh, for example, in, in England, you've got the Queen or even in America, the, the idea of the president almost sits above people and there's this real reverence towards that position. Whereas in Australia, we just don't have that. And even our... our Indigenous people who, who've been here for so long don't have, I think, the respect that they deserve, obviously, in terms of for, from, for their benefit and to be treated with the respect that they should get as people, but also for, I think, our benefit as well in terms of it gives us an opportunity to say, hold on, you know, we are thankful for, for the place that we live. We are thankful for the people that have come before us uh, and recognise that, hold on, you know, what I'm doing in my life and, the, you know, my day to day isn't everything and and there is so much kind of bigger that uh that is more important than just what i'm doing so um yeah it's something that, that that's what i really take from it as well but um yeah it's, it's a brilliant thing that you do i think well i think it's it, it i i see it as how cool would it be like if i was you know maybe i call new zealand home and part of my tradition became to do the haka Right. So like that, my part of my tradition now is to acknowledge my ancestors. And I feel like you're right. We can bring this all together literally by the people that belong to this land. We can do so much better, so much better. Um, and, and, you know, there's a hope, there's a hope that, um, our politics improves, but uh, in the meantime, I think it's just like one conversation at a time, one sort of decision at a time, and you know, educating one person at a time. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked me about that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Yeah, even the way that you mentioned conversations there, and this is what I see is such a powerful thing in in podcasts in terms of the, essentially they're just scalable conversations. So, yeah, I wonder if you could even just speak to the power of, of, of podcasts in terms of a tool for whether it be connection, collaboration, uh, for people using their voice. I know this is something that, yeah, that, that you've observed. Could you just speak to that a little bit in terms of yeah, the power of podcasts for that? Well, I think because of the podcast, it gave me the opportunity to have more conversations. So it was just a natural um progression to kind of go, hey, people, I, you know, I was in this position that did not really understand how to use my voice or how to kind of like uh, actually say the things that were meant to be said or actually say the things that could actually improve uh, the perspective um, rather than just say the same things that everyone else said because it was a popular thing to say, right? That's the sort of, those are the two different kinds of um, voices that we kind of generally hear around the place is the one that's the popular, which is easy to kind of like, you know, jump on the bandwagon and say. And then there's the unpopular um, truth, which gets hidden. 
under all that stuff. And, you know, truth is all relative. So uh, for me, I think because of podcasts, I had these conversations with people that allowed me to have different perspectives. So, you know, just imagine like right now, every time this is something that you challenge me on, which you have already, like I'm having a different perspective. And um, not only that, thinking and conversing in a way that uh, allows your brain to follow thought patterns really helps the neurons, right? So I, I think that podcasting is is become a marketing thing, but it's way more than than just that. Because again, if you consider the fact that right now we stop all the events that we have to capture a selfie because the the capturing image and the social media for images is so powerful that you know we we take selfies so we can use it on instagram or, or later on or send it to other people because of the ability to capture selfies um like that voice has always been such an important part of everything having us us having conversations us you know passing stories to the next generation so podcasting has so many uh, elements and even the, the the element of collaborating with someone that you've never known before is just mind blowing and uh, like none of those names that you mentioned before would have happened would would have been anywhere in my phone if I didn't have a podcast you know so I don't know I'm just a huge fan you know I'm a huge fan so I can talk about this all the day all all the time uh, I think. I think just using your voice, even now, I believe because of Clubhouse, you can like just you don't have to have a podcast to use your voice. Um, and I think it's more about using your voice that I care about than um, than podcasting. I'm, I'm saying podcasting because you get to use your voice and get it to be recorded part of history forever because this too many voices right now that are being heard that don't necessarily need to be heard. So, <laughs> um, so the idea is for the ones who have better things to say, to speak up. So that's why I'm pushing the agenda of podcasting. Yeah. Well, look, I, I completely agree. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Like it, it's something that I must admit, I think it, it could have, you know, if you look at it in 150 years time, I reckon we'll look back at podcasts and even, you know, spoken audio as a bigger revolution than the printing press in some ways, in terms of it has all the same implications in terms of the decentralization of information, access to information for the masses. Uh, but at the same time, people don't need to be able to read to consume information for podcasts. I think, what is it, 15% of people roughly are dyslexic. Uh, plus, you know, obviously, you know, illiter Ill people who are illiterate. Uh, and that sort of thing as well. But but the other thing as well is it's not just the consumption of information, it's also the presentation of information. So to me, it, it could you know be a bit of a paradigm shift, even in the way that people present information, because it's not as if there's one established uh, viewpoint that gets put out there and you know it's very much take or leave it sort of thing. You can either be establishment or anti-establishment. Where now we have a, a mechanism, we have a vehicle to have so many more of these conversations, which are the important conversations because they lead to change. And uh, I know it's actually, I believe it's the, the description for your Should I Start a Podcast podcast, uh, which says about, uh, what is it, you know, every uh, movement in human history has started with a conversation. Uh, and what podcasts are, they're, they're scalable conversations in that sense. And, and to me, there's just such broad application there for that reason in terms of, as you say, it gives everyone an opportunity to go, oh, no, I've actually got something to say that that's worth being listened to here. And, and now we have podcasts, we can present them in that way. Well, we've had podcasts for a while and now it's becoming super popular, right? And, and I feel like this conversation has, is the same conversation that's being, has been had for like so many years. So um, I think that the biggest struggle to starting a podcast is that people don't want their voices to be criticized in public. And it all comes from a step. It all stems from that one pain 
because obviously there is probably something in our history where someone has, you know, embarrassed us in public as a child. And as a result, we just don't want to speak up. So um, that is probably the single most uh, uh, obstacle to hearing better voices. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you say that because I remember there was a flippant comment you made and it was was so flippant one time, it was if it was nothing, but to me it was so profound. And you'd said one time, uh, you know, it it can be, I think it was liberating, I think the word you lose was liberating to recognise your ego or to to understand your ego a little bit more and and do that kind of self-reflection because you can also understand what motivates other people when, when they act in ways that are a little bit confusing in certain ways or uh yeah w- w- was that something that that i suppose came naturally to you or was that more of a gradual process of recognizing i suppose that the role that your ego played oh my ego is just the worst in the sense that when you when i catch it right um when i catch it because it comes from this this good and bad to the ego, right? It is good and, and you can define it however you however the, it, it, it suits you because it's such a crazy concept that is not, um, you know, it's not a physical thing that you can touch. So it's like, oh, how do you define the ego? So um, for me, uh, I believe that um, we go through life hoping people won't touch any of our wounds Right. And that ego has created all those wounds that are actually superficial. And the ego, in my opinion, has kind of created this persona that doesn't want me to be hurt, obviously. And sometimes it has created these situations that are not real or maybe real, but are, are not transferable for the rest of your life or rest of my life. Um, So that's why I feel like getting those lessons in ego, it helps a lot because then you realize that I don't have to worry about this wound anymore. Like for for example, for the longest time, I thought um, what would, like I find it weird that people listen to my voice. I mean, I'm, I'm meant to have, a, I'm, I'm Indian, I'm meant to have a funny accent, right? When I first came to Australia, I had to learn to say things like differently because I remember being uh, made fun of when I said the word differently to how everyone here said it, right? So when I kind of realized that it was the word it had nothing to do with me it was you know it, it and and then i don't have to worry about that anymore like i don't have to keep worrying about that particular thing every time i'm having a conversation so it's almost like i've just freed myself from a disease and i think that that's what people land it lands up happening to people that because we store all these little hurts and pains and things that these programs that are continuously running in, in ourselves to keep us safe, uh, supposedly, um, it creates these, you know, diabetes and high blood pressure and cholesterol and all these kind of disease that cancer. Um, and the more I, <laughs> it's funny because the more I ask for this to happen, the more it happens and it happens in even more crazier situations than I actually want it to happen in. But um <laughs> in the long run it's actually really good yeah it's so uh it's so interesting i remember um a time when uh you know i had a, a day at work i was living with a friend up in melbourne and, and working in geelong had about an hour to uh to come home and and something had happened at work that day and i was just getting so worked up and you know it was, it was the end of the world in many ways in my eyes and i had an hour to stew on it and i get home and i walk in the door and i go to tell my housemates you know this huge problem and one of them just goes Oh, but that's all right. That's just your ego, isn't it? And it just diffused this kind of, this entire thing to kind of recognize. And, and it's almost a little filter that I try and apply now in terms of, hold on, if, you know, if he was there saying, oh, it's just your ego, is it? 
what would that uh, what, what would then then do to the issue in itself? And I suppose that's indirectly in many ways what this podcast is about, because, uh, you know, individuation is the idea of the persona, the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Uh, and, and to me, like, as you say, like podcasts are such a, a, a good way to get that out there. Um, because, you know, I know we've spoken about this a, a little bit before. I won't get too much into it. I know you've got to go shortly. But uh, but I think, we, yeah, we're, we're almost trained in a certain way to think that we don't have anything important to say. And, um, and, and I think, um, yeah, look, even, you know, there's a bit of a notion that if you don't have anything to contribute, why would you sort of say anything in the first place? But I think what podcasts do, at the very least, they give us an opportunity to refine, you know, what we would say in that situation. Um, but they also give us an opportunity to contribute to whatever conversation we want to uh, in that sort of sense. In terms of we can talk, you know, if we have something that we're passionate about, we can speak about that regardless of who we are or, or where we come from or who we're supposed to be. Uh, we can have that autonomy to, I suppose, pursue that mission. And it seems to me that podcasts are such a good way to do that. Well, if you, most people have an opinion about everything, right? They just have it inside closed doors and um, they, 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 they have it in a place where they don't get challenged. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you really want to do something about your opinion, then, you know, join a whole bunch of us that are trying to like, trying to trying to not be alone in the way we feel because that's probably what it's all about it's like we want to express ourselves and not everyone wants to maybe maybe you're right maybe you know if you don't have anything important to say don't say it and i think that's another element that's super relevant for today's world uh, because i don't think people are in a position to speak most of the time um, they don't have the expertise to in involve themselves in, in an argument. They don't have the backstory. It's just, it's, it's free for all. And I think people should really think, uh, before they say, but I think they should say after they think what they have to say and not, um, you know, have that conversation inside their heads and not give their thoughts an audience. Everyone has thoughts. And, and I believe that's probably the most important thing to do is give your thoughts an audience. Um, so it, it depends on, on, on that audience. And if that audience is the people around you and your family members, and so be it. And if the, that audience is more than that, those people, then, you know, I think a podcast is probably the way to do it. Yeah, oh, certainly. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's almost something that I think of in terms of there's a whole lot of talking, but not as much speaking, if that makes sense. There's a lot of like a lot of noise on Twitter and social media and all this sort of stuff. And you sort of go, Hold on, what, what's the kind of point of that? Or what's the kind of premise that you're trying to contribute towards? But um, look, we'll, we'll leave it there for today, Ronzi, because I know that you've, uh, uh, I'm very appreciative for the time that I have had this morning. And, and thank you so much. And uh, and look, I will, again, just embarrass you a little bit because, uh, look, I must admit, when I went to We Are Podcast in 2016, like I'd, I had no idea what I was doing in my life, really, and had finished up uni and, you know, very much wanted to go down the journalism route and, uh, yeah, recognised that probably wasn't going to be an option. So uh, I suppose to be enabled by uh, your systems and your way of doing things and your philosophies over the last few years, it, it, it's given me so much on a, on a personal level and uh, and even just a, a specific example of that, I can almost think of no other time in my life when I've felt, uh, I suppose, empowered um, than sitting at a, a table for dinner with yourself and your wife, Rochelle, and, and Sean D'Souza was there and Renuka, his wife, and, and Pat Flynn and little old me. And I'm sort of <laughs> sitting there going like, these, these are titans of, you know, the the you know, podcasting world, the marketing world, the business world. And here's, you know, little old Rowan Mackey kind of perched off at the end of the table. So um, for you to give me that opportunity amongst so many others, I, I just have to say thank you so much because, uh, yeah, I, I really can't almost put it into words how much you have done for me. Oh, uh, Rowan, you, you don't know how much pleasure it gives me uh, to hear all that and for you to acknowledge all that because I, don't, I didn't remember that at all. <laughs> 18 or 2019 we are podcast i think that one. yeah 18 yeah. maybe yeah uh so i 
Well, that says a lot about your character as well. Like, you know, this, this normal, it doesn't, um, I mean, I've always thought of you and your character and your principles as, um, as extremely valuable. That's why, uh, I, you know, probably had a soft, soft spot for you through, through the time. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's what comes through. So, um, I'm just, I'm just happy that, that you're part of my life and I'm just happy to be, to be around and see what you're up to. So, um, <laughs> it's all you, buddy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much again, Ronsley. And, uh, and yeah, the psychology of entrepreneurship and should I start a podcast is the name of the podcast as well. And, uh, obviously, you know, where our podcast, uh, is a, a Facebook group that we've got and, and the, uh, and the uh, conference every six months or so now. So uh, look out for those. I'll put up all the links on the podcast page for today. But thanks so much again, Ron. Thanks, Ron. It's a pleasure.